My first guest is a professional magician who's a regular performer at Hollywood's famous Magic Castle. Now for him, magic is not just entertainment, it's a journey of self-empowerment. And now he's helping others to find their sense of empowerment, as you'll see in this new documentary, John's Ultimate Illusion. About 10 years ago, I was at a restaurant having dinner by myself when a five-year-old boy came up and said, Mister, what's wrong with your face? But before I had a chance to respond, his mom grabbed him by the arm and she said, Don't bother the nice man. He has enough troubles already. I thought better of it. I realized this could be a really great teachable moment. I introduced myself to the boy. Hi, my name is John. What's your name? You know, you have a really good question. You see, I had a medical procedure that caused me not to be able to move my face. But it's my new face and I love it because it's cool. It's different, just like yours. I share this true story to remind adults to treat people who are different with respect and compassion. Most of us don't have a choice in our plight. For me, I had brain surgery. I did not ask for a brain tumor. I did not order it from Amazon. This was a four and a half centimeter acoustic neuroma. It was about the size of a golf ball. It was killing me by displacing my brainstem. That was the little alien in my head. Oh no, you can tell, you see his little hands? Sure, I can joke about my condition now, but that came after many years of therapy and overcoming my depression. The surgery paralyzed the left side of my face, made me deaf in the left ear. I found the best therapy for me to regain my self-confidence was performing magic. I'd done a lot of magic as a kid, but remembered how much joy it brought me. I was lucky enough to live in Los Angeles, California, only a few miles away from the Mecca of Magic, the exclusive Academy of Magical Arts, better known as the world famous Magic Castle. This is where top magicians from all over the world come to perform. That became my goal. I passed my audition to become a member, and little by little, starting building my act, doing impromptu magic throughout the club. The more I performed, the more I realized that audiences watched my magic, and my deformity disappeared. An amazing act. My ultimate illusion. From surgery to stage, it took me 10 grueling, fun, and rewarding years to reach my goal of headlining in the close-up gallery at the Magic Castle. This was a dream come true, and it happened notwithstanding having a brain tumor. Performing magic became my life-saving therapy. I wanna make sure that you realize that any of us here could be in my position or even worse off in an instant. Now, I hope that's not true of you. A letter remind you to treat people who are different with the respect and compassion you would ask for yourself. The next time you see someone being disrespected, in the need of a helping hand or just a friendly smile, let your compassion intervene. Use your superpower of a simple hello and create momentum to make the world a slightly better place. One parting word of advice. If you ever find yourself sitting across a card table with me, you might want to reconsider. Not only am I a good magician, but I have a great poker face. Thank you very much. You know, John, it's obvious from that clip that for you, magic is far more than just a collection of tricks. Yeah, magic allowed me to deal with my own demons and allowed me to build my self-confidence again after my facial paralysis and allowed me to communicate to people who I was as a human being. Mm. And that moments of astonishment allowed people to completely forget about the facial paralysis. Mm and admire the, the skill in doing the close-up magic. 
Isn't that what we all hope? We hope that people will be able to see beyond the surface to who we really are in our heart and in our soul. And it's amazing to me that magic has been such a direct conduit for that for you. You know, of all the art forms, I think magic has the ability to grab someone's attention mm -hmm. because they're like, wait, wait, what did I just see? <laughs> yeah. But then hear the story of the, the routine uh -huh. and to immediately transport themselves to a place yeah. that I can lead them yeah. is just, it's, it's an amazing. And that's the wonderful thing about close-up magic, which is a particular genre of the art form, which is very present and very immediate because it often asks the other person to hold something in their hand or select a card and it has a very intimate distance between you two. So it's much less a performance and much more like an interactive experience and a conversation, which is, which is tremendous. Uh, earlier in conversation, you were telling me about how you got started in magic. I, I did, like many kids, I got a magic set when I was a kid, but you had a more personal interest. Yeah, my uncle Milton, he lived in New York, so I met him when I was like five or six years old, and yeah. he came over to Grandma's on a Saturday, and and uh, first thing he did was pull a quarter out of my ear. Yeah, <laughs> that's a classic, right? And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> Uncle Milton, how did you do that? And 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 he could tell how excited I got. Yeah. And so he kind of, he didn't have any kids of his own, so I think he took me under his own wing and said, mm. maybe I can share a little of my magic with John mm. and see where it goes. Mm. And so every year on my birthday, there'd be a gift from Uncle Milton with a new trick. Mm. And I'd tear it open and read the instructions and figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. And then he'd come into town and we'd sit there and he'd show me the nuance of how to, how to maybe present it in a different way or how to build a story around it. Mm. And so that's really what fed my interest. You know, I think magic as a hobby for kids is so tremendously empowering. I mean, I know when I was a kid, as hard as it is to believe I was not popular in school, come on, I know, no. But uh, I mean, actually I was, uh, I'm, I'm about six foot four and I had a couple years there where I shot up like a weed and my knees were not altogether reliable and I was like the second to last guy to be picked on all of the sports teams. And so I was not feeling very empowered amongst my peers, but magic gave me the ability to do something they couldn't and I found it very empowering. And I, I know that it's been like the same experience for you. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's not so much, I mean, it, I did some magic in high school, but. yeah. Um, I was involved with theater and then I was in the band, so I had a lot of other things I would mm -hmm. focus on. You kind of, you know, uh, life interceded uh, in your pursuit of magic and- you, Absolutely, you've done that three yeah. or four times through my, through my life. Yeah. Where I put magic on a shelf yeah. and then focused on whatever I was interested in at that moment. And, and then you had this life-changing event and magic turned out to be just, just the trick to help you transcend it. Yeah, because it really made me understand that there was more to my life than my facial paralysis. Mm. And it allowed me to share who I was mm. through my routining, through the stories I would tell, as I would mm. do things like turn Monopoly money into real money and back again. <laughs> yeah. You know, which is one of my signature card one of my signature illusions that I do. Yeah. And it brings audiences back to when they were a kid. Mm -hmm. When they were sitting there thinking Oh my God, now I'm rich. I've got a $500 bill. What can I go buy with it? You know, yeah. after cleaning up Monopoly. Yeah. And so I, I try to find things that bring us all back to the times of innocent in our lives. For those who don't know, becoming a member of the Magic Castle is a very prestigious thing. And you actually have to pass an audition to become a member. So the skills that you developed in your youth helped you with that. And then you went on to become a regular performer at the Magic Castle. Um, how important was it to you that you got to perform at the Magic Castle? You know, when I, when I joined back in 2007, uh, it took me a year or two to feel comfortable, to sit down at a table, to, to start doing a trick or two. Um, but as I performed, I started to understand that audiences didn't care about my face. Mm and that they were really focused on the magic. Mm. So I put together an act and I was finally booked by our uh, director of entertainment in the close-up room. Mm -hmm. Now the first time I was in the close-up room, I was with my Uncle Milton as a teenager. And we sat in the back row and I'll never forget, we're watching the performer and my uncle said, you know, Joan, if you apply yourself, maybe one day you'll be there. In 2014, that dream came true. 
as I walked through the curtains and sat down at the in the close-up gallery, yeah. which is the the ultimate place where every close-up magician wants to make it. Yes, it truly is the in a way the mecca of magic, right? All magicians want to perform at the Magic Castle and the close-up gallery. There's more than one showroom at the venue, and the close-up gallery gallery is a very intimate setting, and there's a chair and there's uh, 23 seats and then two at the table. And you're really sharing a personal experience with people. What was it like for you the very first time you performed that very first show in the close-up gallery? You know, there's a very small dressing room right behind the curtain. And so I remember standing there and the nerves were gone. It wasn't, um, it wasn't necessarily that I wasn't prepared. Hmm. It was the excitement of coming out. Right. Right. Rush and, of adrenaline. And the, the, the host comes out and introduced me. And I come through the, the, the curtains and I sit down and I just took a breath. And I saw fortunately familiar faces in the crowd. And it was like I had been there forever. Hmm. It just felt so welcoming and so amazing just to be there and start my act. Hmm. Um, you know, it just... The, the the reactions of the audience in that in that room are amazing. I think that's evocative of what all entertainers feel when I mean in sports they say people are really on their game and as a performer when you are s very studied and proficient with what you do to the point that you can let go of the technical technical aspect of it and be in the moment uh, uh, connected to the moment to moment reality that the audience is experiencing that feeling of being home, a lot of entertainers feel that when they're on stage, and I think it's so marvelous that you felt that when you sat down in that chair, because you were home. You'd really, you'd walked the path and done what it takes to cross that finish line. So, so kudos to you, that's amazing. Now understand, whereas I joined in 2007 and I premiered in the Close Up Gallery in 2014. So I had seven years to hone my act right. and to get it ready. Yeah. So it's not like it was the first time ever performing that act. Yeah. I had done that act thousands of times yes. before I actually was featured in that room. That's right. Uh, there are impromptu performing spaces at the Magic Castle. I've seen you at the tables there many times, mm -hmm. and I take real delight in sitting at the table knowing what you're going to do and knowing what the climax of the effect is going to be, and they don't know. And then I get to watch their faces, and I get to see them react, and I feel uplifted by it. And what is that experience like for you when that person experiences that moment of mystery, that moment of magic? You know, oftentimes I'll be sitting at one of those tables and a group that I've never met before, men, women, they'll sit down. And uh, as I start to perform, you know, they're, they're thinking, hmm, what's the guy's problem? What, why, why is his face paralyzed? Is it, did he have Bell's palsy? Did he have a stroke? Huh. So they're, they're a little distracted. So I start with a story about how um, I had a brain tumor and it was removed, and I acquired some new skills while I was on the operating room table. Hmm. And the skills I acquired allow me to manipulate people's thoughts. And then all of a sudden they're investing. Yeah. <laughs> because now they want to know what happened in that operating room that allows me to do some of the amazing feats of mentalism that I do. Yes. And I feel all of a sudden the audience immediately accept now, now that they know why my face is paralyzed, it disappears. Yes. And now they're 100% focused on my magic. That's right. And I see audiences start to lean in and their body language changes. Mm. And their eyes start to dance. Yes. And they're 100% focused. And uh, that's one of the most amazing things. Um, about performing impromptu magic at the club yes. is it's that constant interaction and constant conversation with the audience. And they are really, really interested. Um, you know, in my 30 minute act, I've been told that I have like seven moments of astonishment that cause the audience to take right. a little gasp. You know, and I, I work for those, and it's all about timing. You know, I had a history in, in college of doing a lot of improv. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it is, is that learning your audience, learning yes. what makes them happy, what, what, 
where you're leading their mind, and then boom, you jerk it back. Yeah. And they go, whoa, how did that happen? You know, something that they're not expecting. Yes. And so I've had so many uh, hours of practice doing that. Now, when I get actually in the close-up gallery, um, the moves are not so memorized, but they mm -hmm. become automatic. It's mm -hmm. not, I'm not pretending to be a character. Mm -hmm. I'm just being myself. You know, I, I often say that the reason why we are performers is for the audience. They are our reason for being, and that, that reason is really the connection we make with them. And I think that in a, in a world where everybody's got their face down in their phone, and they're so distracted by a million things, from cat videos to politics to whatever's going on in their life, when they get into a moment with you at that table, and they're actually right there, their mind is nowhere else, and you lead them right up to that moment, where the miracle of magic happens, that to me is the real magic behind the magic. And, yeah. and for you, you've told me that um, this issue that you deal with, with your face, you've turned it from being something that you saw as a detriment to something that you actually see as part of your superpower. There was this woman named Billy that I met at the castle one night. And she was with a group and um, I was kind of looking for a group to do a show for. And she was walking down one of the hallways and she was dressed all in baggy black clothes. She had a hat that reminded me of a witch's hat. And I could tell that she was not having a good time. So as she passed, I said, hi, how are you? She stopped and she gave me this look that said, just leave me alone. Mm. And so I ignored her advice and I caught up with her in a group. And I went to the group leader and I said, guys, have a good time. And they're like, oh my God, this is an amazing place. I said, well, let's do some close-up magic. And they were all excited. So we went over to one of those impromptu tables in the corner and I put Billy to my side. And I made the show about her. Every magical moment that happened, it was because she did something. She hit a button on a card or she imagined this or she wrote something that down that I could reveal to her. And within like two or three minutes of making her the star of the show, her posture changed, mm. and she ditched the hat. Mm. And she started smiling, mm. and I could tell for the first time that evening, whatever baggage she brought with her that night was no longer in her mind. And so I finished my half-hour show, and normally audiences would get up and walk away, but this audience, they wanted more. Mm. So I shared the story with the group, how I had hid from cameras and mirrors mm. for over 12 years, because I didn't like the way I looked. You know, going through my photo library and my computer, I discovered there was a gap of 12 years where there was not one posed picture of me. And that all changed in August of 2017 when I went to my first magic convention in Las Vegas called Magic Live. And I was amongst the greatest minds in magic. And I said, damn it, I want to, mem I want to remember these moments. So I started taking pictures with the greatest magicians. And that was the beginning of really my healing, where I understood that if these idols of mine didn't mind taking a picture with me, why should I mind being in a picture with them? Hmm. So I shared this story with the group. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, Billy stood up. She motioned for me to stand. And she gave me one of these hugs that well, you don't seem, you never forget, you know, because it's, it's like you haven't seen your brother in 10 years kind hmm. of hug. And after 30 seconds or so, she stood, stood back and she was crying and she said, John, I want to share something with you. Four years ago, I had a double mastectomy because I the BACA1 gene. And my mom, my aunt, my sister all had their breasts proactively removed and I was the last in the family to do that. And as I heard you talking about your journey, it made me finally realize that I've been doing the same thing, that I've been hiding from life because I wasn't comfortable in my own body anymore. And I think you just managed to shave eight years off my hiding. Mm. And every time I tell that story, I get goosebumps because that moment was so real. And she was crying, so she excused herself and went to the bathroom. And one of her friends, whose jaw was wide open, said, John, you don't seem to understand. We've known Billy for many years. And we've been there supporting her through her journey after her breasts were removed. 
And you did in 30 minutes what we've been trying to do for four years. And that's when it really dawned on me that magic wasn't, for me at least, wasn't just for entertainment. Mm -hmm. That I had the ability to empower others, to inspire others, to like themselves. And to say, hey, if John can do this kind of quality magic and storytelling with his face being paralyzed, there's no reason why I should be hiding. Mm -hmm. And so um, my new speaking platform is being different is your superpower. Isn't it nice to know that you can have such a profound effect on somebody else's life? You know, making those moment, those connections with people at the Magic Castle mm -hmm. and inspiring them to make changes in their own lives made me understand that I had a bigger mission, mm -hmm. that I wanted to get my message out there, the message of being different is your superpower. And so uh, I was uh, urged to do a TED Talk, which I did. And I realized then that now I had a l much larger platform where I could speak to hundreds, if not thousands of people. I decided at that point to start a motivational speaking career where I share the tools and that I used and discovered through my journey that allowed me to learn how to love myself again mm -hmm. and how to change people's perceptions from a guy with a paralyzed face to someone who is has something different mm -hmm. that has that self-confidence that allows them to push way beyond any kind of physical deformity and to be able to make an impression on a much wider audience. Mm -hmm. I think in essence they see how empowered you are, how confident that you are, and they say, well, if John can do this, so can I. Yeah, absolutely, and that's really my message. It's the transformational aspect of what we do as performers, that we take people out of whatever moment and whatever emotional state they're in, and we deliver them someplace better. And you've done it for you, and now you're doing it for other people through motivational speaking. Yeah, so many people you know, have something like as I did, and, and friends and family would say, oh, we love your smile, John. Your smile's you, it's your smile. But I didn't like my own smile. You know, until, until I finally accepted it deep in my chest mm. that it was okay to be out amongst public mm -hmm. with a paralyzed face. And that was really when the transformation happened, when I truly accepted my difference mm -hmm. and decided to celebrate it. And that's really the message that I try to get out there when I speak to people. Yes, and you're helping other people make that kind of transformation, and you have a website about that. Yeah, it's ifjohncan.com. Right. And you can go there and you can watch many videos of me performing and speaking for, for hundreds of people and sharing the tools and the methods that I discovered while I was healing mm -hmm. that allowed me to rebuild my self-confidence. So, so many of us in, let's just call it modern society, we, we live on such a, a surface level. You know, our, we have tweets and we have posts and these things are short and they're sometimes impersonal. Everything is on the surface. We look at people, it's our first impression. Physically, what do we see? How do we react to that? And many people don't take the time or invest themselves to look beyond the surface. I, I look at your journey and I see that you had kind of like closed the door on yourself and you felt safe behind that door. And then through magic, and it, for anybody else, it might be anything that they're interested in, anything they get a joy out of in life, but you were able to reopen that door and step out and step up and let people see you and be okay with it and show that you had something to share. And now you're actually empowering people to open that door for themselves. I know you're the subject of this documentary, John's Ultimate Illusion, and I know that earlier in your life you were involved with theater, but you'd never done anything like a documentary before. So I'm curious to know, after it was all finished, how, looking back over the experience, how do you think it changed you? Again, I think it just gave me that much more confidence. You know, mm -hmm. one, of my, one of my closest friends since my surgery is Jamie Lee Curtis. Mm -hmm. um, because of my IT consulting company in Los Angeles, I was introduced to her, mm -hmm. and I became her IT guy. But our relationship really went way past that, as she and I became really close friends. And she was the one who said, 
I want to be in your documentary. I want to tell your story. I want to, wow. you know. So she is a she is highlighted in that documentary, and there's some uh, other amazing people in the documentary. I was fortunate enough to perform for Alex Trebek for his 75th birthday, hmm. and there's a clip of me performing for Alex in my documentary. Yeah, and then there's a great magical mind is named Bob Titch. Yes, and he is uh, one of those magicians that you go to. Uh, for advice on how to improve your act. And so we became friends, and he got invested, and he became uh, a focal point of my documentary. Hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it's just been an amazing whirlwind of uh, finally finishing it and getting it out there and hoping that it'll give people a little insight on the story of right. my journey and how I was able to get past my adversity. John, I want to take you back to the moment when you had screened your documentary. The first time you had seen it cut together. What was that like? So I was sitting in the editor's little studio, and I was sitting there with a, with a small monitor, and I was just completely engaged. And when the, the documentary finished, I, I was just totally overwhelmed. Mm. That all of this, these three years of hard work, mm. and it was cut down to a very nice 15-minute documentary. Mm. And it told the story so well. Um, hats off to the director and the editor. They made me shine. Mm. Mm. I think the nicest part about that is that your journey, which had happened day by day for you, suddenly became visible as a complete story, almost like reading the novel instead of living it day by day. And I, I just love the idea that your story of personal empowerment is empowering other people. And I know you did something very similar to, to that with your TED Talk. So what was it like to stand on the TED stage and address a much wider audience than you'd done at the Magic Castle? You know, it was funny. You know, I got there and uh, having a theater background, uh, I got on stage and, and uh, it was 700 seats in the theater. And I was a little nervous. So, uh, but I looked up and I saw that the college kids were focusing the lighting, hmm. doing a really horrible job. <laughs> And so I took my jacket off and flung it over a chair and I said, hey guys, can I give you a hand? <laughs> and we, we entirely relit and focused the entire show. Oh, good. Show. Yeah. Because there was a big, when, you, when you're doing a TED Talk, there's this red circle yeah. carpet that you have to stand on. Yeah. And the lighting was just, you know, I couldn't move. I was like stuck there, I'd be out of the light. And I was like, no, open it up. I'm yeah. bringing the audience up to do a magic trick. Yeah. Make it, make it, you know, make it look better. And we yeah. moved it way downstage. Yeah. And so I didn't have a chance to do, be nervous. Mm. You know, so as soon as we were done, they let the house in and uh, I was the first presenter. Mm. But going out there and seeing this sea of smiling faces yeah. was just, I was, I was on cloud nine. Wonderful. You know, I knew my, I knew my speech and it just, it was a funny story. So about three quarters of the way to the speech, um, the front lights go out. And I went, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> and then three or four seconds later, they come back. <laughs> and I said, magic <laughs> and the audience laughed yeah. now John you you your journey has taken you in on a lot of unexpected paths I mean uh, I know you did theater in, in your youth and then you got into the IT business and then of course you had the operation and uh, then you rediscovered magic and you reconnected with people. You did the TED Talk you are a motivational speaker you have the documentary um, so looking back across the expanse of time, you said earlier about there was a 12-year gap, was it, when you hadn't taken a photo, a posed photo of yourself. Right. And what an amazing journey you have made in the time since then. Um, in the next decade, when you look back, what do you hope to accomplish going forward? Wow, really good question. You know, through the journey, I found joy and happiness. Hmm. 
you know, and that's what was really missing from my life. Mm -hmm. And now that I wake up every morning with a half smile on my face, <laughs> knowing that I have the opportunity to inspire people and to meet some amazing people and allow them to follow in my footsteps and overcome their adversity. Yeah. The, the world's my stage. Tremendous. Yeah. And for anybody who knows anything about the history of magic, there was a gentleman, and I'm, I'm going to get you to tell this story because I really love it, but his name was Doug Henning. And there were a few people who really changed the face of magic in my lifetime. And uh, Harry Blackstone Jr. was a very much a classical visage of a magician and what you would expect with top hats and rabbits and illusions and uh, commanding, almost imperious nature, but a very magical <coughs> nature. And then we got uh, Doug Henning, and Doug Henning was more rainbows and wonder and, right, and getting into the joy of things and the feeling. So less dark and mysterious and more joyful and, and, uh, and, and filled with wonder and possibility. And then we got David Blaine, who is again dark and mysterious again, and does he have real powers? But for me, um, there was an era where it was Doug Henning and David Copperfield. And David Copperfield really kind of brought magic into a conversational, easy style where you felt like he was not playing the role of the imperious magician, but playing himself. And I know that you are very much yourself when you perform. But I remember looking at, you know, Doug Henning and David Copperfield, and I knew David Copperfield from his TV specials, but I knew Doug Henning from his Broadway show. And I had the cast album, and I must have listened to it a thousand times. He was such an icon, as famous as anyone in magic in his era, and you, sir, had a chance to meet him in person. I did. You know, uh, growing up in the 60s, the late 60s, early 70s, uh, there'd be TV specials. Yeah. And Doug Henning had numerous TV specials. Yeah. And I remember going through the old TV guide and saying, okay, Mom and Dad, we've got to have dinner by 6 because Doug Henning's on the TV and right. as a family we'd sit there and I'd be three feet away from the yeah. TV just staring at it, trying to see what he was doing. And, you know, he was just this open, open, wonderful human being performing yeah. magic. You really sensed the joy and the happiness that he felt in performing. You really did. You know, you saw the joy of performing and it made it through the TV set to mm -hmm. you. So, so tell us, how did he come into your life? I uh, was a theater major at Cal State Northridge and uh, at that time I was in charge of the campus theater and they would bring in uh, groups to perform on campus. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got hired to work with Doug Henning as he rehearsed one of his tours that he was taking on the road. Oh, wow, yeah. For a month. So I got to be his assistant for a month. And I learned some amazing illusions, uh, how to make cars disappear. He made an elephant disappear, and I'm sworn to secrecy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I got to be behind the curtain, as you will. Yeah. To see a professional magician and how they approach solving a problem. Hmm. But I remember the first day I, I met him, he did some close-up magic. Yeah. And it was a very standard trick where coins go from one hand to the other. Yes. And I remember going home that night and finding my coins. And I came back the next day and I said, Mr. Henning, can you help me with my coins routine? Yeah. And he said, well, sure. And every day at lunch, we'd spend 15, 20 minutes working on the coins across routine. And Doug Henning used this little golden nugget as the mm. thing that attracted coins from one hand to the other. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I learned a little bit more about the mechanics of doing that trick. The month went flying by, and we had loaded out a show, and we were sitting there just relaxing, and all of a sudden Doug comes running back into the theater, and we're like, oh my God, did something break or what's wrong? And he said, no, 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 I want you to have this. And basically, Doug gave me his golden nugget. This, the one that he used? This is the, the actual oh one. Oh, my gosh. Let me look at that. See, okay, see if you can get a tight shot of that. Wow. Wow. And so this was owned by Doug Henning, and he felt that he had somehow saw that I loved magic so much yeah. that maybe somehow this could be important to me. So I wear it wow. every day of my life around my neck. 
Now, John, I know Doug Henning was not the only mm -hmm. luminary in magic you got to meet. Tell us a story about a um, famous magic duo. Right after college, I uh, built my computer consulting company, and so a yeah. friend of my friend was uh, uh, worked with Bernie Newman, who was Siegfried and Roy's uh, publicist. Ah. And so they hired me to fly to Vegas and teach Roy how to use a computer. <laughs> and so uh, they flew me, uh, flew me to Vegas, and a limo picked me up and took me out to their fortress, which was their uh, oh, yeah. magic uh, palace. Where they had the white tigers yeah. and everything. Yeah, it's an, it's, and, it's an estate, gigantic. Right, and so uh, they took me to this little bungalow that was set up as an office, and I sat there and, and got everything ready, and I was waiting, waiting. You know, in comes Zigbee and Roy, and Zigbee sits in this chair with his arms crossed, just laughing, laughing, laughing at Roy. And Roy sits right next to me, and I started and within about 10 minutes, I could tell Roy's eyes were glazed over. <laughs> right. Because someone may mentioned to him that maybe it would be a good idea for him to learn how to use a computer. Yeah. But he wasn't into it, so he stopped me and he said, John, I don't think this is for me. And I said, oh, Mr. Horn, a lot of people went to a lot of trouble to bring me up. Let, let's continue. So he yeah. says, okay. And so about 10 minutes later, Roy stopped me for the second time and said, John, this is not for me. Uh, I don't care what it costs my company, but can you take this back? Huh. Um, and I said, well, I, I guess so. And he said, I'll make you a deal. Um, if you take it back, I'll let you be my guest at the estate for the rest of the day. And you will be our personal guest at the show that night. Wow. So I'm like, I can't pass this up. Yeah. So Zikri and Roy say their goodbyes and they head out. And in comes their head animal trainer. And the guy says, okay, here we go. I had no idea what we were going to do, but we took a tour of the entire property. And I got to see all of their animals, their white tigers, and their, they had lions and elephants and giraffes, and it was amazing. Um, and all of a sudden, one of the other trainers comes with this little tiny white tiger. Oh, wow. And I got to pet this little yeah. White Tiger. Yeah. And his name was Montecore. Oh, my goodness. And that was the, the cat hmm. that ended up injuring Roy yeah. on a stage that ended his career. And it, it, it was because the cat had such a close relationship with Roy right. that when Roy had fallen, the cat did as they do, as they would pick up a kitten, and they the cat picked him up to help him. Right, yeah. So, he uh, took very, him off stage uh, very to sad protect story. him. He made tremendous strides after his surgery. Oh, and he did. regained his cognition in a way they were unsure that he would. And, and you know, sadly, he's not with us now. But what a tremendous, I mean, in, in their day, there was no bigger magic act in the world or in Vegas. They were literally synonymous with Vegas and for the White Tigers. And their work with uh, animals and wildlife and the foundation that they have continues to go on. So that is, that is tremendous. It, and, came, it came full circle. Yeah. Um, I was uh, booked in the close-up gallery at the Magic Castle in 2017. Yeah. And backstage is a little door and the manager says, are you ready? And I'm ready. And, this time, the, the, the manager's name is Bob. He says, John, i got a little surprise for you. I'm like, what is it? He says, you'll see soon enough, right? So I get introduced, and I come through this curtain, and I sit down, and there is Siegfried sitting in the audience. Wow. And so I got to perform for Siegfried. <laughs> and that was, and after the show, he came up, and, and I reminded him of that story that had happened back in the early 80s. Mm. And he was like, that was you? <laughs> so he remembered that. So it was just, it was a nice closure to our meeting, the, the two of them. Yeah, tremendous. I mean, I had an opportunity to meet them and you almost feel like you're in the presence of- Royalty. Royalty, exactly. They were magic royalty. You have a new book coming out. Thank you, Bruce, I do. The book is called Playing the Hand That You're Dealt. It starts out as a memoir, starts with the moment I woke up realizing that there was something wrong in my ear through diagnosis, surgery, recovery physically, and then dealing with the emotional scarring of having my face paralyzed and how magic allowed me to heal to the point now where I speak on the world's largest stages, motivating others to take whatever their difference is and make it their superpower.
And the last part of the book is me reverse engineering the processes that I've developed over the last 10 years on how I dealt with my adversity and came out the other side, how I learned how to love myself again and accept who I was and communicate that to the world. And I hope I've done it in a way that people can pick out little tidbits that might they might be able to apply to their own lives mm -hmm. that'll make them more comfortable with who they are. John, how can people find out more about you and what you do? Uh, my website is the easiest way to get a hold of me, ifjohncan.com. I try to keep it simple. Yeah. Uh, there you'll be able to find my contact info, uh, ability to hire me to speak to your groups, um, but to learn a little bit more about me and see some amazing interviews that I've done with some major uh, celebrities that you might recognize. Tremendous. Yeah. Well, a very storied career you have had up until this point. I look forward to you one day telling the story about a magician slash talk show host that you met and what a great time you had on his show. Bruce Gold, ladies yes! and gentlemen, Bruce Gold. John Kippen, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Bruce Gold. It's been a pleasure. I've thank you really for being on the Bruce Gold Show. Thank and we so will much. see you next time on the Bruce Gold Show.